Okay. I thought I had a figure in there, but I don't. That's okay. Let me just, uh, you know, by the end of this trip, we'll have gone up and down the Okanagan almost the entire thing. So, Kelowna was here. Okanagan Center was here where we had the, the type section. Then we crossed over, and then we've been driving along this ridge here. So, Okanagan Lake is continuous from the city of Vernon, which is actually just over there, over those hills nearby. And it's on the, there's a, in the north part of the basin, there's a big ridge that separates the Okanagan Lake from two other, or two or three other lakes. The biggest of the three is called Kalamalka Lake, which is that really nice blue looking one that we saw just before we turned off up here. That delta that we pointed out to you guys uh, is right here on this DM. You can actually see it down here. And then there's a few other small lakes. Uh, Wood Lake is another one. So we're on this ridge which is the same ridge that we were on when we stopped at Okanagan Center, just further north, okay? So we're almost at the north end of the lake. What is this, a bird? Yeah, it's bird. Yeah, it's bird. <laughs> um, and we're here because it's just an opportunity to see some drumlins. And drumlins are both kind of ubiquitous and on the footprint or on the bed of, glacier, of ice sheets. I should be careful about this of ice sheets mostly. Um, there are literally probably hundreds of thousands of drumlins under every single ice sheet that ever existed. Um, there are lots of them in British Columbia and there are lots on the Laurentide, there are lots on the Fennis Canyon. There are presumably a number of them uh, under the Greenland ice sheet and, no, I mean not Greenland, sorry, long day, Antarctic ice sheet. Um, but there's a lot of different, there's been very many different ideas or hypotheses how they form. And, you know, we'll talk way more about it in class. Um, but the long and short of it is that there are competing hypotheses, but there's not one that seems to be really um, clearly over the others. They each have issues. They each explain some parts. They each have problems. Part of the issue and why it's so... Snow tires. Good, studded snow tires. Um, part of the issue is that you find drumlins in a whole range of different materials. They're in all kinds of sediments. So often when you look at a definition of a drumlin in a textbook, it'll tell you, yeah, it's a hill made of till, it's kind of elongate, and uh, it's poorly sorted because it's made of till and it's asymmetrical. But when you start poking around drumlins, you realize there's drumlins made of till, there's drumlins made of gravel, there's drumlins made of sometimes lake sediments, go figure. And there's drumlins made of bedrock. And so you kind of have to find, ideally, an idea and a hypothesis that can explain all those occurrences. And if you can, you know, if you want to reduce geomorphology to really simple ideas and terms, if you see a bump on the landscape, and we'll just pretend that drumlins are just a bump, your options aren't that many. Either you built up sediment incrementally and made the bump, right? Or you have made the bump out of a pre-existing layer of sediment and eroded everything around them, right? So you can erode the bump or you can build up the bump. You can think of drumlins in the same way. Drumlins, you either erode them into their shape or you build them into their shape. And then we can, we'll see that we can sort of add a bit of maybe reshaping and a bit of erosion, but fundamentally it kind of comes down to those two options. So here we have drumlins, but they're made of bedrock. And there's a fence, so we're not going to cross it. But the drumlins are these bedrock ridges on the side here. And this whole ridge that we've been driving is full of elongate bedrock, bedrock forms like these. And when we could drive back down, look on the golf course, everywhere you don't see grass and you see a knob of rock, that's a drumlin. That's an elongate ridge of bedrock. And so where are they? Well, they're right there, sticking up above the grasses. And they extend down to the south in this way, okay? So those are bedrock drumlins. There's a whole bunch behind. So that you can, uh, you guys see sort of the, the elongate bumpy shape to them a bit? I mean, this is probably one too, this knob right here. You know, there's bedrock right here and they were on the elongate form. Yeah, exactly, there's a nose to them and then they usually taper to a bit of a tail. Where that horse is, that's one. Where those trees are, you know where you see those little gullies between? Those are the, you're looking kind of head on to them. See those? Where the horse is on by the big tree? 
There's one drum in there. There's a second one to the right. There's probably even a third one over. There's one right here. This one in the mid-ground. You see how there's an upstanding knob that's got no vegetation on it? That's the nose of it, and it extends, in this case, to the south. Yesterday when we were driving, I didn't point them out, but just before we started our way down, uh, the, the bedrock, and the, in this case bedrock and till, is shaped, it's kind of a cross section on an angle, so it's hard to visualize and it's hard to stop at that location, but there's drummonds on the plateau, quite a few of them. Can you even see them? Or, actually, they're in your handout. If you've got your paper, go to page, page uh, three and page four. Page four gives you a bit of an area that have been, you know, so the, the light colored areas are areas that are drumlinized and are all in the uplands. If you want to see what some of them look like on the plateaus, there's an image there. It should be in color, but you'll recognize similarities what we're looking at. So there's an air photo, there's a DM that doesn't come out well, but then there's some oblique ground photos and you'll see the same thing. Just knobs of rock that are elongate that extend. Da presumably downflow. So not all drumlins are made of rock. Some are, not all. The fact that they're made of rock pretty much rules out that one of the two options we had of creating them by building up material, because obviously we're not going to build up rock <laughs> locally. So we can be pretty clear on the fact that these are eroded. When it's bedrock, it makes life pretty simple. When it's sediment like till, uh, which we know is not going to be sorted, so we might not see a lot of truncation of, of beds that would tell us that it's been eroded. It's kind of equivocal whether it's buildup of till or whether it's erosion of pre-existing till. We'll get into all those details in class and, and more. But at, at the current sort of state of understanding right now, there's one option, one hypothesis that argues that, you remember those deforming beds from Iceland? That experiment that triggers the idea that tills, the deformation till, and when you saturate the sediment, it, it deforms. So there's an extension of that idea that if you take a deforming layer of till, you can shape it, and or it can sort of move around as it's deforming. It might hit areas that are a bit stiffer, and then that creates a bit of an obstacle, and you start building up some of that def deformation till or that deforming layer behind it. And gradually you start building a, a bump, and you elongate that bump because the ice is still moving over it and the bed is still deforming around it. So you start shaping the bump as you build it into a drumlin. That's one of the options. There's another idea out there that argues that in fact deformation of the substrate doesn't have anything to do with it. Really when you look at drumlins, the vast majority of them are erosional, irrespective of whether they're in sediment, whether they're in bedrock. And that the mechanism that does the erosion isn't a deforming layer of till, but is in fact a really fast moving layer of water under the ice. Okay, so those are completely two very completely different views of what's happening under a glacier. And um, they both have, they're both, they both have difficulty explaining all observations we make at a drumlin. So they, they're not, neither one is perfect. Some are good at explaining some features of drumlin, others are good at explaining other features of drumlins or areas that have been drumlinized. So neither is perfect, but these are kind of the two competing hypotheses currently. But it's even, even though we have two ideas, uh, it's not really clear if there's one that's clearly better than the other. They each have issues, they each, they're each good at certain things, explaining certain features. Kai? Good question. How does water erosion make that shape? So if you get water moving under ice, or even if you don't get it moving under ice, when you have water, you get turbulence in water and you develop turbulent structures that uh, kind of establish a pattern. And once you establish that pattern, it can perpetuate itself. So this particular, you know, your question is a really good one. The idea associated with erosion of drumlins by water uh, suggests that in that wa layer of water moving under the ice, you have turbulence. And you set up turbulent structures that we call horseshoe vortices, the same kind of turbulent structure that you get, for example, when you get a concrete pier in a river to support a bridge. If you've ever seen some of the, the piers, it's a, it's a real engineering problem because the water that goes around the pier upstream tends to 
excavate immediately upstream of the pier. There's this hard object in the flow, and it sets up a turbulent structure we call a horseshoe vortex. And we call it a vortex because it's spinning on itself, and it's horseshoe because it has to split and flow around the pier. And so you can think of drumlins as the remnant, what's left behind after a horseshoe vortex has eroded material around it, and the drumlin is the residual, much like the horseshoe vortex around the pier. The pier is already there, obviously, but the separation of flow around the pier is analogous to the separation of flow around, say, a knob of rock that would then trigger the erosion of a longer, more elongated in a nutshell. We're going to see that in, in the coming weeks with drumlins. So it's a little bit out of the way, but it's an opportunity to see drumlins because they vary in size, they vary in shape in terms of elongation. Um, Nick's from Wisconsin, a place where there's tons of drumlins. Many of them made a till and much larger than these. You know, like seriously large hills made a till. So they form there there and a lot of the landscape in BC, I mean is in the Nile. I'll show you some DM. Unless you see a DM like a a light arm, it's hard to pick out the forms because there's houses all over the place. But if you have a, a DM, you can actually see the elongated kind of tapering forms and they're they're right in town. So um, yeah, they're they're all over. So you can't really think and talk about glacial geology and not at least and not, mention not, not just not mention them, but not attempt to even get into the explanations of them. Um, but we'll leave that hanging because it's a long discussion. It's getting late. We're gonna we're burning daylight, so I think that that's the last stop today. We're gonna get back on the bus. We're gonna head back south. Um, I think depending on how fast we can get through Kelowna, we've probably got about an hour and a quarter of driving to get to the campsite. So that should be it. All right. So I know it's been a long day. Um, we'll recap first thing in the morning about. The, I mean, if you have questions, obviously, always happy to chat about them. But We'll sort of like, you know, put things a bit back together in the morning, just about your project and what we saw and some of the takeaways. And then we'll just wrap things up tomorrow morning before we start heading back to, to the lower mainland to catch a ferry. So tomorrow what we'll do is we'll drive south of Penticton and we'll go talk about dams and drainage and what happens to these lakes and where does, all, where does that all go, right? And what kind of lake are we dealing with again? We'll remind ourselves and does that still work? Because we've, we've talked about a lot of things. So we'll start by kind of like summarizing our ideas and where our hypotheses sit after a full day of looking at things, okay? Alrighty. So there was no real like bumps or anything, no? It was just a flat bedrock. If it was only a flat bedrock, if there was nothing there? Yeah. So, if there's nothing there, you can still generate vortices. The, so, water that's turbulent naturally develops. Eventually. Yeah, eventually. First, it cause, it's almost the same situation as when you initiate ripples on a sand, a bed, a sand bed. You can start, you know, especially when you do it in a flume where the conditions are really controlled. You start with a perfectly flat sand bed in the flume and you run the water over. And the water, at some point, because of its viscosity and everything, you know, remember the Reynolds number concept? for yeah. turbulence it can't help but become turbulent at some point after a certain distance and the moment that you do that you don't even need bumps on the bed it could be you know a very smooth flat sand bed you're going to naturally create turbulent structures that then modify the way that sediment is being moved and that's the inception of the ripples yeah. so you could run water over a smooth bed and it would still start developing turbulent structures which could then trigger a bit of erosion which then it's a bit of a feedback loop and where you've had, had erosion that perpetuates more establishment of the turbulent structure which then enhances the erosion which is you know reinforces yeah. the the turbulent structure and so you sort of have this process where it naturally just sort of appears it's way easier if you got bumps yeah in a in a flat bed i would yeah. assume it would like start making the channels yeah so over the drumlins so the view on drumlins is that they don't start from really like little channelized flows. They start from broad, yeah. wide they sheet. Start. Exactly. Okay. So the whole thing is covered under in water and it's moving as a sheet, not as a single, single channel. So, if so it, it's the, or sorry. Keep I was going to say, if it continued, maybe it would turn into 
the channel. Yeah, it could. Yeah. And then now often what we see, honestly, is we tend to see drumlins and in the it, amongst fields of drumlins we see tunnel valleys. So the idea of water argues well, initially the the, the flow is really broad and moving fast and it's eroding drumlins and at some point like you said eventually it becomes channelized it kind of collapses into more discrete streams and that's when you start eroding tunnel channels so is the so, idea then that if drumlins are erosional they'd be formed you know relatively quickly before that big sheet of water collapses into the channel yeah that would be the, that would be one of the implications that they're formed fairly quickly but or that there's sufficient water that you maintain that water sheet configuration for a long time or you do it repeatedly, I guess, is the other option. So my yeah. question then is, if for whatever reason you are able to maintain it for a long time, why wouldn't the drumlins get destroyed? Because once you initiate them, they tend to be somewhat stable. Okay. Right? Especially if you have this horseshoe vortex. Yeah. It'll be eroded a bit, but it's more efficient at eroding around it than okay. the knob itself. And the knob becomes almost a point that helps perpetuate the... Not to say there's no erosion of the knob, but less than what's around it. So you strip away the stuff around it. Yeah. There's also an explanation of erosion of drumlins with this deforming till layer. So, yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll get into those, deep into those weeds later. Back to the bus. Back to the bus. I'd offer to drive so you can nap, but I guess I won't. <laughs> and no, I'm good. <laughs> I'm just going to see the best route. I can see the hand 